Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are here this morning from the Stanislaus County Employer Advisory Council, and I'm going to turn it over to Lourdes now for a warm welcome. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I hope. Um, I'm super excited um, to have our first meeting for the Stanislaus County Employer Advisory Council, EAC. Uh, we haven't had one in Stanislaus County for quite some time now, so we're super excited. Even though we're, it's, a, it's via webinar, we're just happy to be able to provide you some great information with, uh, for businesses and HR professionals, which is what we're here. I'm going to introduce Harpreet and then we'll let him get started. Um, so Harpreet Singh is a business and employment attorney who worked for employers and employees in navigating California employment law. He is the managing attorney for Western Seam Law Firm in Modesto, California. He came to the United States in 2008 and graduated with his Bachelor of Science degree from uh, California State University Stanislaus with Sum Cum uh, Laude honor. And he has been a small business owner since he was the age of 20 years old. <laughs> Um, to enhance his legal knowledge and about issues that came across uh, operating a business, he enrolled in law school. He graduated with a Juris Doctor degree with honors from Purdue University Global. And then he was admitted to the California State Bar in late 2017. With his experience as a business owner and now as a business and employment attorney, he not only understands law, but also the difficulty that business owners uh, following stringent employment laws. We re he represents both employer and employees in litigation, so he understands both um, of, of the views and practices in, in dispute. In his free time, he likes um, to get socially involved with business chambers and other social activities. So I'm happy to present to you guys Harpreet Singh uh, as a presenter. Thank you, um, Lourdes, and also to the EAC to provide me this opportunity to uh, to give some basic uh, legal information about changing laws um, because of COVID. Um, so I think uh, you all are aware we are in this pandemic um, and especially the employers are get affected a lot uh, because of this. And there are like several rules and regulations which are just coming up. Sometimes it's very hard to keep pace of it. So today I will discuss about one of these rules and regulations uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 transmission at your workplace, what uh, responsibilities you have in terms of notification and also the leave benefits to your employees. So you can have, I think, uh, at least basic grasp on these uh, rules and regulations so you don't uh, get into an issue with uh, the authorities or you don't get penalized because you have also other issues to deal with either your revenues uh, and your sales. Uh, so just, I think if you are in compliant, that would be good. So I will provide just basic information and if you have any questions, so we will, I think, try to answer those questions at the end of the session. Uh, so just keep your questions to yourself uh, or you can even put in the chat and and later I think we can uh, probably Lourdes can work out on that or Katie can help me out in terms of answering, uh, reading those questions so I can answer it. Okay, let's uh, move forward. Um, so first about, I want to talk about the notification, which is, uh, let me see, okay. Uh, so it's uh, AB 685 uh, law, which was recently passed in September. Uh, so this is this law basically provide rules for employers to provide notification to their employees at workplace and also other people associated with the employees. And also in some instances to provide notification to local health authorities in terms of uh, just providing information about a COVID uh, spread at your workplace. So this law basically provides uh, its uh, four notification you have to provide. Uh, first, we will just learn you have to notify the other employees at the workplace and then the uh, representative if your workplace have some union. So an exclusive representative need to be notified and then 
uh, notification to your employees about uh, different benefits which they can seek uh, because of this issue. Um, and then there is another notification about uh, if there is an outbreak uh, in that situation. So, so what, what is mean by that outbreak and you need to notify obviously the local health authorities. So we will go through the basics of the notification which you have to provide. So if the employer, so the main thing is that if the employer uh, learned or we're informed about uh, a, a positive case of COVID-19 at your workplace. So within one business day, you have to provide a written notification about such uh, positive case. Again, you have to uh, make sure those privacy laws remain still in place about employees. You cannot disclose about the identity of the employee or uh, in any way, suggest a particular employee has COVID, obviously you can, uh, I think uh, in the audience, uh, most of the people are connected with HR. So you already understand means uh, maintaining the confidentiality of the medical uh, examination, either it's related to COVID or any other, that's important. So you just basically are notifying that there is a uh, spread uh, in our workplace, one of the employees got infected. So you're basically informing other employees about that. So the first notice is just about that uh, to notify all the other employees. Um, and so the main thing now you would be thinking about, okay, uh, so what, what I have to notify uh, which person or, or who would be that uh, person we will notify about and and in the law that person is called qualified person because now that person uh, how you will judge that person is a qualifying person what are the criteria what are the situation because probably you would be thinking okay i have heard probably this employee have uh, some ish health issues uh, but in terms of law what which person would be qualifying person for that notification so first is a lab confirmed case um, obviously if you have received uh, any uh, if your own work site is doing tests so you would be able to know which employee uh, you are talking about or or even if there is a confirmed case or not and the next if you learn about uh, from a healthcare provider if employee mentions you my healthcare provider has uh, diagnosed me as a positive COVID case. So, so that would be that situation. And if there is an isolation order, if suppose there is a, a self quarantine order, which is applicable to one of the employees. And if you came to know about that or an employee informed you about that, so that would be one of the situations you need to notify to all the employees. And obviously another situation is the death if one of the employee unfortunately die because of COVID, uh, then again, you have to notify all the employees about that situation without compromising the privacy of the particular employee. Again, as we discuss, uh, you have to provide written notice. And another, I think, important thing in this law is about uh, also notifying uh, the employer of the subcontracted employee, like a staffing agency, you need to provide that notification to staffing agency as well, because mainly that's the uh, employer uh, of that uh, of those employees. And also, it's a good practice uh, because I think the law is somewhat vague uh, uh, in this sense. The law also required you to provide notification to. Uh, to other people who would be affected, who would be working at your workplace, it would probably come under those uh, subcontracted employees. Uh, but it would be, I think, also to keep track of the people who were working at that place during that infection period to also notify them about, uh, about such a positive case. Um, the um, what would be the method of notification? It's your normal mode of method. If you are uh, talking with the, or sending notification previously to your employees through emails, that would be the method you have to use. Because uh, again, you have to think about it's one business day. So if you 
usually I think uh, it would not be, um, I think a usual method to send them a mail, but I think it would, it would be a good thing, but obviously you need to notify them as soon as possible. So usually you are making those other notifications through an email, text message, uh, those normal mode of uh, communications. And also another, I think key part of it, it's, uh, it's the language of the notice. So the language need to be at least, uh, English is one of the language uh, you have to provide notice in. And the other language is, uh, is the language which is used by majority of your employees. And especially if we are talking about Central Valley, so it's uh, Spanish, uh, that's uh, one of the more you have to provide notice in that because, because the main purpose is to notify employee if they cannot uh, properly read English. So, so how they will uh, understand that and, and try to take measures on their own uh, or at least notify you if they feel they have symptoms about that. So, so that's also the key part, English and the other language of majority of employees. If uh, maybe in some of the communities you have more Asian communities, so you have to understand uh, which employees uh, language I think you are dealing with probably there is Indian community so you have to provide that notice in that language either it's Punjabi English uh, sorry Hindi so uh, so you have to I think figure out that based on the majority of employees so the next notice it's uh, if you have union if if there is collective bargaining agreement in place uh, so to those set of employees uh, their exclusive representative also need to be notified. So the notice would be about the same notice. Uh, it's basically mentioning that there is one of the employee tested positive. So we are just notifying you about this pursuant to AB 685. Um, so the next set of notice is to provide those employees because, uh, and it would be very logical. You are just telling these employee that there is one case of COVID uh, now you have to also provide notice about what are the benefits in this situation an employee can get. So the employees have like a good knowledge about what to do in this situation. If they are also came in contact uh, or if they are just working and, and you only have like a one uh, set of, uh, I think, uh, room which all the employees are working. Now those employees based on uh, the present uh, isolation orders, uh, either it's through the state and localities, you have to self-quarantine yourself. In that situation, obviously any employee would be thinking about, okay, what will happen about my pay means they have to pay their own bills. So, uh, so that's the big consideration. So these, uh, this notice about employees to provide or uh, providing knowledge about the benefits and the employee protection uh, that would be helpful for your employees. So basically your notice is mentioning about different leave benefits the employees have uh, if, they, if they come across this COVID situation, uh, because now there is a whole set of leave and, and I will talk about those uh, in a moment. And also you have to just mention about any retaliation and discrimination is unlawful. And also, I think you are now more experienced employer. Probably I'm dealing with in this uh, attendees or you are just working with uh, uh, an organization who are uh, well organized and set up in terms of their HR compliance. So, uh, so you understand any retaliation directly, indirectly, uh, lowering of any hours because this employee had any COVID issue that's unlawful. So you also understand the consequences, civil suits, dealing with labor commissioner's office. Um, so I think, uh, so, so that's the message you want to provide to employees. So they get confidence that, that the law is on their side, at least on any kind of indirect retaliation. So the next notice is about the safety plan. Now you notify the employee, there is positive case or a bunch of positive cases. These are the benefits you can get. And now you not, uh, need to notify them about the safety plan, like what you are doing at your workplace to keep it safe. Either uh, obviously you need to follow all the CDC guidelines. And I think if you go to the CDC website, 
and also to covid.ca.gov. So the state also provide different kind of employer guides. Uh, so which provides uh, how you can practice those protocols set by state in order to, to remain uh, transmission free at your workplace. So you need to provide a little bit about that. Uh, basically, if you already have an employee handbook and if you have uh, added a, a section about how you are taking precaution, what are the practices you are using. So you just mention all those, how you will get disinfected all the places where you thought that there was one of the positive cases in the area of your facility. So you need to provide notice about that. Uh, so the next thing, so it was, uh, so I just talked about all the four uh, notices. Um, so the next thing is about, okay, what uh, what will happen if you will not comply with this? So obviously the state will come after you, either it's labor commissioner's office or it's uh, department of industrial relations enforcement wing. So they will uh, come in terms of putting penalties, um, and, and as you know, means they are, especially means I have dealt with few businesses. So, so either you are dealing with Calosia, because if, uh, if you are not following those guidelines at your workplace, so Calosia is doing audits of many businesses now, uh, since uh, the lockdowns were a little bit, I think, lowered in June. So they are making visit as the facilities, either it's retail businesses, or, or any kind of manufacturing businesses. So you have to deal with those civil penalties and also civil lawsuits means if there is a situation where employee got hurt and got hurt means employee got uh, COVID-19 at your workplace and your workplace is, is all over uh, and not following any protocols of the state. Now you have to deal with maybe if you have more employees, a class action lawsuit about that. Uh, so there is a whole lot of stuff, I think, on the legal side, which you don't, you should not deal with. Um, so the next thing is there are some of the prohibitions, um, as I have already mentioned about keeping the privacy of the medical examination of the employees, because in the notices, you don't have to, or not in any way, indirectly in any way to to disclose the identity of, of any employee who tested positive uh, in these notices or in any other way. So you have to think about that. And also I think there would be a lot of litigation because if you think there are only few employees, so uh, it would be difficult for an employer to uh, even to keep that privacy. So, uh, so obviously there would be a lot of litigation. Maybe the employee doesn't want to uh, I think disclose certain information. So there would be, I think, good amount of litigation which will happen because this is a new law. And so, so as time goes on, so there would be probably litigation from employee side or the employer side. Uh, so another, I think it's also about retaliation. So you cannot retaliate an employee uh, mentioning about that I will disclose your COVID-19 result to other employees. Uh, so that you cannot take certain leave benefits. So, so that would be another retaliation, which would be costly in court. So um, in terms of keeping those notices, you should keep copies of those notices for at least three years. That's one of the requirement. And another is about the outbreak. So this is really very important because as you know, COVID is, um, it's an infectious disease. So it will spread out means, so you know about one of the positive cases you have, but you, uh, once you know that it's almost that employee was before that working with other employees. And as you know, there is a certain amount of time frame uh, means that probably that employee have came into contact with some other person and then they get a symptom about that. And then you have COVID because because many employers, and especially if I'm talking about employer who have less than 50 employees, they are not doing tests on daily basis. So the problem is that there can be a time frame where you have one, one of the employee who doesn't get a symptom, 
uh, for a couple of days, but still they were in contact with this other group of employees. Uh, so now you have an outbreak where you have more than three uh, lab confirmed cases of, of your employees within a two week time frame. So if that happens in that situation, you need to notify your local health officials, either it's, it's your county health department, uh, because they can keep track of it. And in that situation, you need to uh, mention about the name number and the occupation and the work site of the qualifying employees. So this is the, I think the trickier part and there would be a lot of litigation because on one side you have privacy laws and on the other side, uh, you are supposed to disclose this to the health officials. Uh, so obviously an employee would probably, I think most of the employee would not care about it, but few employees would like you not to disclose it. So there would be a lot of litigation about privacy versus uh, following the law and notifying the local authorities about it. Uh, so there is an exception uh, on which employees you don't have to notify. Obviously, if you see the health facilities, because the hospitals, they are all obviously dealing with these patients. So if there is an outbreak, it's understood. So there is no special notification, which is because they are already taking precautions. The county is already engaged with them in terms of tracking COVID-19. So, um, so health facilities doesn't uh, need uh, the employers doesn't need to notify to all other employees and also the people who are engaged in testing screening and and uh, who are providing patient care also they are excluded from this notification requirement so um, so the other things which this law provides other than notification requirement is the cal osha uh, as you already know, so the Calosia is the agency which um, makes sure that your workplace is uh, is kind of at minimum risk or risk free in terms of any industrial uh, injuries to your employees. So, so this agency means I have seen at least I think a couple of uh, business owners um, they have like uh, two three visits done by Calosia because. Uh, because few of the businesses are not following the mask requirement, which is required for their employees, especially if you are talking about retail businesses. So they just want to make sure if your workplace is safe for your employees. And also it uh, helps out your customers. So this law broadens that authority of Cal OSHA because when you're talking about Calosia means they can, uh, if it's a serious risk you're creating by not following this protocol, they can shut down your business, uh, virtually shut down your business because, um, because their main purpose is to just reduce rat risk. If you're not following all the protocols, they can shut down your business or at least part of your facility uh, because you're not following all the protocols. So this uh, act or this law, it just broadens that authority. And, but still it's only COVID related. So, uh, so it has its own uh, sunset date, which is January 1st, 2023. And I hope we would be out of this pandemic uh, into 2021. Uh, so Calosia doesn't have to I think bother employers anymore. Uh, and also in terms of citation, if it's a very, I think, uh, serious risk you are creating, there can be even citation because if you have, I think in compliance world, so citations usually comes in, there is an opportunity to cure those issues at your workplace, but this law provides authority to Calosia to provide those citation even before that 15 days of cure period, even before that. So uh, if there is a serious, uh, uh, I think risk created and any, you can understand where the employer is not following anything. So in that situation, Calosia can cite you even before providing any cure notice. So, um, so again, it's, uh, so this law is 
become effective. It's January 1st, 2021. And still, as you know, uh, we have heard news of vaccines, uh, but uh, but still, I think we would be dealing with this pandemic it's at nine least till, uh, till summer. So, um, so let's...